Hello, everybody. And welcome to the start of the Big Steve Backstage Pass on YouTube channel. This is a very momentous occasion. Not only are we doing this in the midst of everything that's going on in the universe right now, but we are starting something that you are going to love, and we are going to love bringing it to you. And it begins by a very simple thing. Let's all turn ourselves back in time now to 1968 in the summer of that year. I was standing in front of the place I lived in San Francisco, 70 Brady Alley. Around the corner on Market and Van Ness was the Carousel Ballroom. The Grateful Dead and the airplane were trying to run it at this time, and it was just turning into the Fillmore West new location. And Bill Graham, who becomes a dear friend in my life, was trying to take it over from the Grateful Dead and the airplane. He didn't like the fact that bands were running <laughs> their own theater. It was a bold experiment. So here is the time and place. And I was standing on Brady Alley and looked across. And when I was a kid, my dad told me, he said, one day you're just going to help somebody when they're trying to do something so simple, and that's going to change your life. And by God, he was right. I walked across because I saw this guy struggling with a, a big cabinet. What it was was a base cabinet. I didn't even know what a dual showman. It was a Fender dual showman base cabinet. And so I helped him. I walked over and said, can I give you a hand? And he looked at me and just said it with his eyes. And he showed me how to put my hands on it. We tilted it back, lifted it out of the truck, and we walked him going backwards, me going forward into this doorway that was right there across from my house. And it was Pacific High Recording, PHR. Little did I know that the Grateful Dead were rehearsing in there that day. Now, I always say that I got my job because of drugs. See, the sound man for the Grateful Dead at the time was Augustus Owsley, Stanley Owsley. And he is going to be talked about a lot. And we can talk about him today, too, but the guy who I was helping bring that in, his name was Ramrod. And he was the head of the crew of the Grateful Dead at the time. Now, there's a picture of Ramrod right there. And that's at Duke University, where we were on a tour later on. And uh, we played a little bit of football <laughs> before the while we were set up waiting for the band to start sound check. And that picture was taken right around that time at Duke University. Now, um, when I started with him, he began to show me what to do. Why? Because Johnny Hagen, who I'm going to show you his picture in a minute, he and Ramrod had grown up together way, way up in eastern Oregon in a town around Pendleton. Hagen was from Pendleton, but Ramrod was from Hermiston, Echo, all these other little towns around there. And these guys were cowboys and farmhands. Hagen's family had a, a ranch where, a wheat ranch, where everybody would work in the, in the summer and the winter because the whole wheat, was the biggest crop around there. And then you had cows next and the Pendleton Roundup is what it was famous for. Now, Mike Hagen was Johnny Hagen's brother. He was Ken Kesey's roommate in college, Mike Hagen. And so he, when the pranksters were driving the bus, Ramrod and 
he doesn't have that name now. His name was Larry Shirtliff at this time. He and Johnny came down together to drive into Eugene to drive the bus for the pranksters and hang out with those guys. And then a short time after that, the Grateful Dead needed a, to start forming a road crew because they were getting tired of lifting their own gear and it was getting heavier and it was getting a little bigger. And so they needed some guys. In those days, it was even before the term roadie, we were called equipment handlers or equipment crew on that thing. Quicksilver had what they called their quippies, and we worked with them a lot too in the early days. Now, from that moment on, I stuck with Ramrod, and he liked that I was helping him. Johnny Hagen was so high on STP. STP was something that Owsley had just come out of the laboratory with. It was a four-day LSD trip, and we took massive doses in those days, so we just didn't know. We all started off taking Sandoz, pharmaceutical acid. Owsley's thing was... That was such a great trip. One of the best, purest made in Switzerland at the Sandoz uh, factory. And when you took that stuff, you realized it was the purest kind of LSD-25. Owsley's dream, and he worked on this before I had come around, he started making tabs of acid, 500, five, excuse me, 5 million was what he ended up doing in his career there but he had them distributed in the bay area and in the haight ashbury you could get it very easily everywhere it was the highest quality lsd and when you were at a point where you took stp you were high for four days and hagen was and he was in no condition to get focused on what he needed to do helping Ramrod. So I stepped in and started helping him. And from that moment on, I began to learn and it opened every door in my life. It was like destiny right before me. Here's a shot of us together. We spent every time, I spent so much time with him after that because he was moving also at this time. Everybody, 1968, they were starting to Think about moving out of San Francisco, but always people moved constantly from the Haight-Ashbury to other areas of San Francisco. And Ramrod was always having to move them in the company van, and which was something that I started helping him with. Whenever he needed me to help him, he would come and pick me up there, and we started learning around. But the first few days I was with him, he was living with Owsley over in Oakland, in the Oakland Hills. And so I had to pass the acid test with Owsley. Now, you know, when you got to this point, it was a sacred thing to meet Owsley. And it was a very important step in your life if you were going to be around the Grateful Dead. Being Ramrod's friend opened up every single door that I needed to open because he was so respected. He was so great. And everybody loved him. The pranksters loved him. He got his name from the pranksters when they were on a trip to Mexico. And him and Johnny Hagen and he, Kesey, were off running around in the bush and Ramrod and Hagen and Kesey get stopped by the Federales at a crossroads. And they had a jar, a peanut butter jar of marijuana. And Kesey took off running and hit headed out for the jungle and just started running. So Ramrod and Hagen got caught. Their pictures taken, he, Ramrod told me, with a giant table piled up with drugs of all kinds and said traffic, traficantes. And they were put in the Pinal in Mexico. They got rescued a few months later by a prankster named Three Stooges. He was called that because he looked like all Three Stooges. 
we called him Stooges. What a guy. And his father had been the ambassador to Germany, to West Germany, after World War II. He was a diplomat. So he knew who to call and what to do and sent Stooges' brother George down to the Pinal, and they got Hagen and Ramrod out of jail. Shortly after that, Ramrod got his name, Ramon Rodriguez. That's where Ramrod came from. But a Ramrod also, in cowboy talk, is the, the boss of the cattle drive. And so this special individual opened these doors for me. And he takes me to where he's living with, at Owsley's house. And um, that night, I slept there. We got in kind of late. And I woke up. And I was sitting at this big table with Owsley and I, just the two of us. And he starts checking me out. And he admitted that I had a nice intro by coming in there with Ramrod. But here we were sitting there, and he starts showing me and talking to me about the Chronicle. He was reading the San Francisco Chronicle, and he's on the car, the uh, comic strips. He starts showing me this comic, Odd Bodkins, which he loved. It was just a strange San Francisco comic book. So we started to discuss the strange things of life. And in that process, he, we were having a little coffee together. He was meticulous. Actually, he was meticulous as how he made his coffee and tea. He would explain to you put the bag, because I said I wanted some tea. Did he have any? He, he said, put the bag in the cup, pour the boiling water over it. He was really like that. Count three minutes and get it out of there, and that's your perfect cup of tea. He was, everything in his world was like that. He was an alchemist, and he was a very smart person, and he'd been in the Navy and the Air Force by this time. He was born in Kentucky. His grandfather was a senator from Kentucky. Here he is right here next to me as we were starting to work together because that day when we got high together, he checked me out and in the living room of his house was painted over the mantelpiece, under the mantelpiece and through it over the fireplace was the tree of life. And that was painted by a guy named Bob Thomas. Now, in this picture, you see I'm wearing a necklace and that Grateful Dead shirt, the first Grateful Dead T-shirt that had the skull and lightning bolt. And that lightning bolt stood for enlightenment in your mind. It was very cerebral, too. Not only were we working with our hands and feet and muscles to build everything and to start on the Grateful Dead equipment, which was heavy stuff already. Alzi was always buying every Macintosh amp he could at this time. And we called him Bear. I'm going to refer to him as Bear a lot because that was what he told us. As soon as you met him, you start calling me Bear. You don't start talking about Owsley or any of that because he was hot commodity with the authorities. And so he didn't want people knowing who he was at shows all the time. And so it was very interesting because he said, if you start getting too high, Steve, I want you to sit down and stare at that tree of life. He gave me a good dose of acid in that tea. And so I was doing that. I was sitting there looking at the tree of life and the branches that went off. Now, that relates to a thing that we did always at other times, oak tree therapy, we called it. If you could go outside and getting too stoned, you find a nice tree. Oak trees work great. Relax yourself, calm yourself, and go with the branches. And it, it, it just worked. It made it so that you didn't feel uncomfortable with your high. Just a little side tip, okay? But anyway, out in the backyard of his house, Next door to his house, this person there had a mountain lion in a cage. And so you could hear that 
all the time you heard that mountain lion walking back and forth and, and kind of not very happy that he was in there. And so it was a little disturbing to me to see that. And so I began to open up to Bear and then in came Bob Thomas. Now, Bob Thomas was a great artist. He, he was the one that would produce all this beautiful art for the Grateful Dead and for other things. But he was an eccentric, like all the people I were meeting from this point were. And so Bear and I were sitting back. We went back and sat at the table, and he started quizzing me some more about what I knew, what did I think I was going to do around here. And he had behind his head, there was a, a dresser of drawers, and it had a very interesting thing. These two six-foot-tall wooden candlesticks really beautiful hand carved wooden candlesticks and we were talking intensely about what i felt my friendship with ramrod and helping him would be where i would start and suddenly one of those candlesticks fell over and we both looked at each other. There was nobody in the room but us. There was no reason that should have fallen over. It was standing almost against the wall, and it fell over. And he looked at me and said, that's a sign. He said, that's a sign. We weren't sure what it was a sign of, but from that moment on, we began a friendship and a trust that was essential to working around the Grateful Dead. You had to have Owsley believe in you. Now, there's another guy I want to talk to you about. His name was Rex Jackson. There he is. Now, Rex Jackson and Ramrod, he, Rex was from Echo, Oregon, and he was a Pendleton boy, too. He, he was really a powerful individual. He literally just was bigger than life in every way, as all these people were to me. And Jackson was him and Ramrod had met in reform school and they had been friends ever since they got in a fight the first day when Jackson took some of Ramrod had a pack of camels he was hiding. Jackson found him in the dormitory and started smoking them. They got in a fight and they become friends for life after that. And that's a lot of the ways guys were in these days as we were growing up. We were raised in the 50s, came to manhood in the 60s. It was a turbulent time in 1968. Vietnam was raising, raging. If you didn't go to school or work or had reasons, you better watch your ass. It was all over on us, man. The authorities were on us all the time. Now, Jackson and Ramrod, having been in reform school together, I said, what'd you do, Ramrod? I said, How, why'd you guys have to go to reform school? And he told me that they had stolen a bottle of whiskey from a farm hands truck while they were working on the pea harvest. You drive a truck along next to a combine and catch the peas. And all the guys did that when they were teenagers for work. So they got sent to the reformatory, the boys' reformatory, in Eastern Oregon, and it was a tough place. And they learned some skills there, but they were in there for a year. And I started laughing. I, I would, remember I said, what are you laughing about? I said, well, because where I grew up, I grew up in New York City and then came to California when I was just 17 and a half, about to turn 18 soon. And as soon as I could get there, I wanted to be in, in Haight-Ashbury. And to fall in with these guys in the first few days I was there was incredible luck in every way. Now, I was laughing because why? I said to them, well, when I was growing up, we would just boost uh, boot beer and liquor off of trucks and begin to tell them stories about how the cops would just smack us around and take the booze for themselves. So they were very interested in a city boy. Here's a city boy that's telling them these boys were from the country. And I'm talking about way out there in the boondocks, as we called it. And they were hot rodders. They, they were working their whole life. They were strong. When you grabbed Ramrod's hand and shook it, 
it was like leather, man. His palm was solid. I talked to him about that right away. He said, yeah, in reform school, we had to milk cows. And, and, and he said, it just gave you the strength in your hands. He had really strong hands in that way. And he, and, and Jackson was beyond belief. He was something else. And in those days, you know, in the Pendleton roundup, these guys had seen a lot of beer uh, and whiskey fueled fights with cowboys around that time and and just running around hot rodding as jackson always had the toughest 55 chevy he had a red 55 chevy and he tore up the tracks up there and would run across uh the police constantly they were chasing him all the time and couldn't catch him they knew who he was but they had to catch you in those days dead to rights to give you your ticket or arrest you or whatever it was a different time and so here we are and so this bond started happening where we could work together because when we went into a city i could explain to those guys how cities work they had no idea and here they were having to go on the road with the grateful dead everywhere in america and they were teaching me country ways and so we did a lot of that anyway where we cross referenced city juvenile delinquency with country juvenile delinquency basically is what we were called in those days so we were all intelligent but ready to learn everything we could now the crew was getting was bigger than this there was also um some other people trying to come down everybody wanted to work for the grateful dead man it was a real choice gig for what people wanted to do in those days. Now, this picture here, you see myself on your left, way over there. That's Big Steve. Next to me is Ramrod. He's tilting back, drinking a beer. There's Harry Popick and Betty Canner Jackson. But I want to talk about the two guys after them. There you see Kid Candelario, Billy the Kid. He and I were pretty much the same age. He's a little older than me. So I was the youngest guy of all these guys. Ramrod was five years older than me. Hagen was also, he's on the end next to Kid on the very end on the right. And so myself and Ramrod, Kid and Hagen started really hanging out together all the time and going and moving everybody when they were wanted to. And we all started working for Bear at a place called the Lembic on Judas Street. And this place was the most amazing place to learn your crafts. In this place, we were building speaker cabinets. You learn woodworking, which I'll talk a little bit more about in future episodes and as, as we unwound this world. Then you learned amplifiers from Owsley and Bob Matthews and ron wickersham who came from ampex the tape machine company alzi would recruit people at this time he was recruit in his brain everybody on psychedelics he was recruiting this crew of psychedelic warriors and also i would always say to everybody we need a cast iron mind because of all the drugs we were taking psychedelics and the very little food we ate, we needed cast iron stomachs. So you were ready and rough and ready, I called us. We're, you might find us rough, but we're ready. And so we were forming this crew at this time. And at Alembic, we, where we worked in the daytime on Judy and Ninth in San Francisco, Jerry would come there, uh, Jack Cassidy, all the guys from the other bands were all coming down there consult with Osley on their equipment and we would be there to help them and meeting all these guys was just great Paul Kantner we smoked weed all day long with it. also whatever we did that was our thing man you know because you could do anything you wanted you learned right away in the Grateful Dead you could wake up in the morning and drink a whole bottle of whiskey if you wanted to but were you worth a shit for work later that day probably not and it was dangerous to load some of the heavy gear and what we were doing if you were too messed up. 
marijuana was the perfect thing, the perfect thing. Switch back to me, and this is our thing that kept us going. It kept us so that we could go out there and work in front of a crowd of 40,000 people later on. When we started, it was small places, but we still always smoked pot, and that smell was around us all the time because that was a thing that bound us together and it kept us so that we were sane, believe it or not, you know, because we, we being young men, you know, you get angry at each other, but it was a way to cool out. And, to, and if we did have an argument, it was a way to smoke the peace pipe between us, whatever. And in the hate Ashbury, everybody did it. And basically when we weren't working in those days, which we did almost every day because moving people was important, but then there were rehearsals every day and started going to those. And so uh, this picture here is uh, a working on stage picture. Now it's interesting for a couple of reasons, but in this picture, there's some unknown people on the side, but when you get to the center, there's me and it's a piano. We just brought up on stage and there's me and, on my right side is Doug Som. Doug Som had a band, and he's behind him is Martin Fierro, who later joined Jerry's band. And behind him, even one step back with the red hat on, is Joe Winslow, who also grew up with Ramrod and Jackson and Hagen in Pendleton. And he came down and joined our crew. Now, when you were hanging around, you were learning how to work and you were meeting musicians of all kinds. We'd go do interesting stuff every day. Around this time, I tried to do something that was a little crazy and entailed um, taking some drugs back east in those days, there was no security and stuff like that. So it wasn't that hard to take some LSD back east. But I tried to be quick to get back to California right away. But I got busted. I got busted with going to an old friend who hadn't told me that he'd been arrested. And he brought a police to me and I did a hand-to-hand -hand sale to a cop. And so I was looking at big trouble now. And I was sent to Rikers Island right away. I'd been in jail a couple of times before because as a rough youth, uh, I read my book, Home Before Daylight. It talks about that whole part of my life and how we lived like that. Now, you didn't talk about anything. You didn't say anything where you got anything. You didn't never open your mouth. And I was like that. So I was looking at fucking 25 years for a hundred tabs of acid. Now I'm going to just tell you a little bit about my dad. My dad was a teamster, fought his way up from the bottom to the top. He knew Jimmy Hoffa and I'd been introduced to those guys. I ran with him my whole life, man. My father was an amazing person to teach you life. And, and the skills that he taught me, how to use tools and how to be this way with people. Because from the time I was uh, just knee high to whatever, to him, he brought me with him to all these union meetings. And there were tough, tough things would happen fighting and yelling and screaming. It was kind of scary as a kid, but I grew up into that life. And so all those tough teamsters were in, were guiding me. And when my uncles and my father, all these guys were World War II veterans, as were everybody else's. And they were pretty seriously straight people. They want, didn't want to see us growing our hair long and, and smoking weed and getting in trouble with the police like this. Thank goodness my father was smart enough. Now, he left me in Rikers for a while because uh, he, he wanted to teach me a lesson. I came out so angry at him. I said, what, what is going on? You know, why'd you do that? He wanted to teach me a lesson. He saw in me what was coming out of him. 
And he had never told me, and I never saw a tear in his eye, but that day when he bailed me out, he had a tear in his eye, and he said to me, you're as wild as I am, and you got to learn that lesson. Because I told him, that was sucked in there, and it sure did. And you can read my book, like I say, to hear some of what happened in there. But he was an amazing teacher. And that destiny was happening now. He knew how to pay that judge off through a, through my lawyer that he had gotten, who was a well-connected lawyer. And he got me out of that whole beef. As we were walking down, when the judge says to me, you look like a good kid. You go, What are you going to do? You're going to school. I said, I'm going right to school, I told the judge. And he said to me, good boy, you look like a good kid. Y-O, which meant youthful offender. I was only 18, under 18 when the crime was committed, 18. And youthful offender, that meant your own recognizance. You didn't even have to report to a probation officer. This is how great it was in that moment. I got a second chance. What would have happened to me? I would have had to do a long stretch and probably never had gotten to live the life I did. But my dad and I walked out of that courthouse and he said to me, you dummy, there went your college money. And, I, and he kicked me really hard in the ass and I fell down the steps and I picked myself up and he said, what are you going to do now? I said, I'm going to the back to the Grateful Dead. And I did just that. And as soon as I got back there, I was welcomed back into the scene because it was important times coming now. And we were building a PA. And PAs were so rudimental in those days. And this is the business card of the Grateful Dead at that time. I always kept it in my wallet when I was given it. And uh, they were rare. There weren't many around. And... When you had that, and there were some other cards that were important to have uh, in your card, in your in your wallet, or wherever your your draft card. In those days, we had to show it to FBI guys when they would grab us, and you had to have your ID or driver's license. So that was simple stuff. We had no cards; everything was cash if we had any, and nobody had any money at all in the Grateful Dead in those days. So you were working to learn. And this symbol of the Viking skull and the skull, enlightened skull with the lightning bolt were phenomenal images. Think of the regalia we had. Now, I want to show you something now, a picture of Sam Cutler. And... He was another intricate person in this whole thing at this time. There he is. Okay, now Sam, was when we met him, he was working for the Rolling Stones. And now Altamont is happening. After Woodstock that summer, which was a real learning experience, and I was just running around with the guys on my own nickel at this time, trying to learn everything I could. So at Woodstock was just an incredible high stage, 30 feet in the air, and all this crazy stuff happened. And we learned about the big festival for the first time. We'll go back and do a whole show on that. But jump ahead now to late November or, or November of 1969 in a place called Altamont Speedway. Originally, this show was going to be a free show with the Rolling Stones and Rock Scully and Sam got together to plan it out. Rock was one of the original managers of the Grateful Dead, him and Danny Rifkin, and Rock Scully. What a perfect name. Can you imagine being born with the name of Rock Scully? And we'll talk about him a lot because he's always in our lives. And he was born with that name. And then he works for the Grateful Dead. So Rock Scully, it was just incredible. So him and Sam right here in this picture, uh, Sam figured it out. So we were going to do it at Sears Point Raceway. 
And we were going to bring the PA from Alembic. And, and that PA was so rudimental. It was only two column boxes that we, we, Owsley had invented them and designed them with a guy named Bob Buchla. So they were called the Buchla Bottoms. All PAs before that were so rudimental. They were just a one speaker A1 cabinet that went behind movie theater screens. And when you went to the rock shows in those days, they were split up on each side of the stage or whatever you were at. And that was the way the PA was. Could hardly be heard by anything over a couple of hundred people. And they, there was really a high horn on the top of them and a 12-inch speaker. Now, what Alzi had come up with were one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight bowed out cabinet of giant tall columns that were painted with red yellow and blue big balloons on the side circles so they look great you'll see them in pictures of altamont at, at the mazel brothers film that show that was the only pa there that day and the stage was only 19 inches tall but how we switched from sears point was bill graham's choice he was helping on the whole thing too and Sears Point was trying to charge him. It would have been so different at Sears Point. It would have been more controlled. There was there was bleacher seats. It was more of a, 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 an environment that was under where you could control everything. This guy called Bill, and he was from the Altamont Speedway, and he said, "Come on over here. I won't charge you guys no fees or nothing." So Bill said, "We're moving at midnight." So Kid and I just take. Kid Candelario, Billy the Kid, we were working together constantly, he and I, at Alembic. And we took that PA to Altamont, and that was the trial of fire, my first one. And Sam got fired after that gig by the Rolling Stones, and he became our road manager. Jerry hit him out at his house until things blew over a little bit because the people were in, up roar over that thinking that uh, uh everybody was mad at the hell's angels something that we now i've been meeting hell's angels through ramrod because they were intricately friendly involved with everyone in the grateful dead at that time and owsley especially and ramrod was in, they were introducing me to these guys little mike um badger um, excuse me, uh, but Terry the Tramp, that was a very important guy. He opened up Oakland to us. Badger was from Richmond. Richmond was the closest to the Richmond Bridge into Marin, where we were moving up to live at this time. And so he was just starting in the club, and we became good friends, he and I. I still wear his ring of the badger skull but when you started with the grateful dead now and you passed the acid test and you were able to hang around a little ceremony occurred and you got this right here and i think we have a close-up shot of that i want to show you when you got this medallion i never took it off you see in that picture with Owsley, I'm wearing it. And if you look in the Grateful Dead in the early 70s, you'll see every single guy in the band was wearing his, Jerry all the time. And myself, I never took it off. To this day, I wear it every day because it was so special. It meant you were part of this thing. You were part of the crew. Now, Bear didn't like it that much because it was made by this guy, Jack the Jeweler, this one the, for us. And... It had only seven lightning bolts. He wanted 13, always 13 bolts. But it made it different enough for us to all wear this, and we knew the difference. Bam, hitting the skull by enlightenment, man. And you certainly had that happening every day with you. Now, we hung out and tightened up and tightened up and became this crew that was so strong around these images these images were so powerful you know it have this nomen this this kind of stuff this regalia so we had t-shirts and we had 
the skull and roses and, and all these iconic stuff that came from posters by the great artists of the Bay Area. So you felt part of a very intricate thing as the, this was all forming up. And, you know, people, when you're, when you're working together under pressure and learning how to work at the gigs and how to bring the PA, Altamont was the test of all tests in every way possible. And so we also were there with Santana and the Jefferson Airplane and other bands. Poco played in the afternoon, I believe. And so we had our trucks parked right behind the stage. And we were constantly working together. So we had all the trucks lined up. That was the backstage. And I, I met Herbie Herbert that day, who was doing Santana's gear with Soapy, Sopalote and Dr. Brown. That was his crew. That was the Santana guys. And we became friends right away. And we stayed friends until he passed away last year. But Herbie was great too, because he showed me other things about learning the showbiz craft from his point of view. He, he, had been working for a band called Fumius Bandersnatch. He even got the Grateful Dead to play at his high school at, uh, in Arinda uh, when he was in high school. And that was a whole big famous acid day in his high school that was legendary. And so Herbie was a great guy, and we were there getting to know each other, and we were all back there on a crazy day. And we'll go into Altamont in Woodstock, there'll be two shows coming down the road because I'm going to tell you guys everything. This relates so much to what you can see now. I realize on the radio show we have such a great connection, but now I can show you stuff. I can show you where we're at and what we were looking at. It seems to me important. Ramrod and I stuck together all the time, so he was a great source. You know, you drive everywhere together and and we'd room together in those days when we went in on the road, the keys were just a pile on the holiday end table and we everybody grabbed a key. So you'd end up with rooming with everybody in the band or, or the crew. We all got to know each other so well. And the crew, we spent all these driving hours too in trucks and we knew each, everything about each other's lives. We began intimate conversations. There were no secrets. Everybody was honestly getting to know each other in a deep way. You know, for instance, I knew now that Ramrod had grown up and his his father had left early on when he was just an infant. And he had an older sister like I did. And they had to go with their mom where she worked feeding the guys on the Columbia River where they worked on railroad bridges that spanned the Columbia and he would tell me about living in these cabooses, these train cars that were on side tracks. And his mom cooked for all these guys. And they would come in to eat. And the, him and his sisters had to go underneath the train car. And he's only four years old and he couldn't talk. Sometimes hours they sat up there eating and talking because there was always a railroad bull with him. That's a cop. And they were busted and fired his mother if they'd been known there were kids around there were rumors and they were always wary of it so they would lay under the cars and not talk and so that made ramrod a guy who he was a man of few words but boy when he said something he, he understood what he was saying and he was amazing and so i hung out with him a lot and he liked to hear all about the stuff that i learned growing up and working in the theaters back east where i learned some things uh and we started a deeper friendship and we got really close and you're learning all the time now and immediately even though we were on the alembic pa crew i was learning the band gear because i was in such a great position with these guys and we lived up at bob weir's place called rucka rucka ranch and that was something that Ramrod had come up with, a way that you greet a young lady, which is in, inappropriate now. But in those days, it was instead of shaking your hand, it was a really sweet thing. It was called a Rucka Rucka. But anyway, the Rucka Rucka Ranch was Bobby lived there and his gal, Frankie, 
that we called Frankie Hart because she'd been Mickey's girlfriend and Jackson's girlfriend before that. And she came from San Luis Obispo and had been a prankster for a while. And that's how we she came down in the scene. So her and Weir at this time were a couple and they were running Rucka Rucka. And I lived there and Jackson lived there and we lived in the barn and there was a little bunkhouse out there. And Sonny Hurd was another guy now comes down from Pendleton and he and I started working together. So there was nobody you're ever going to meet in your life like Sonny Hurd. He started every day, wampa lampa stompa, he'd come out and say. And there was a peacock up there at Rucka Rucka that ran around and that bird hated him. And so he always kept a bat right by the door of the bunkhouse. When he walked out in the morning, that peacock would shoot across the yard and attack him. And he'd start whacking at it with his baseball bat. And it would literally, the peacock's neck sometimes wrapped around the bat. It was almost comical, except it was nasty. Start off the day like that. He was a, another guy who was raised close to the ground and, and was good with his fists. And we all were kind of tough guys, you know, because to do what we had to do now, remember a joint, this much of a joint being caught by the police could be eight years in San Quentin. And you had to do the first third. So we were careful about that. Alzi, all of us, we were real careful. Watch the roaches in the midnight coaches. And we learned how to be stealthy all the way. We already were street kids who knew to watch out for cops, every one of us. But when we were on the road traveling all the time, they were always on us. Could do a whole show on that. We'll get into that. Because one of the toughest things of working for the band at this time was remembering when you got stopped and we got stopped all the time by the police whose nick uh, and aliases uh, people had aliases on their driver's license in those days because there were different reasons some guys didn't feel like going in the army other guys did and were getting out and dishonorably discharged in different ways so like for instance ramrod was richard iverson he was not Larry Shirtliff when you got pulled over. And you better know to refer to him by that name, because if you didn't, you immediately got in trouble. It got him in trouble, and the police would know that you had a false ID. So you had to call him Richard or something like that, or you wouldn't say his real name or anything. And then you had, you know, Kreutzmann, he started so young playing drums in the band, and I was doing his drums at the time, but... He told me about how he had a start with the band under the name of Bill Somers because he was too young for a cabaret license. So that was his alias, but we, he didn't use that much anymore at this time. And then Danny Rifkin, who rode with us a lot, he had Danny Faber was his alias because of problems in his life. So you had to remember everybody's aliases and the real name and keep that shit straight because you could cause problems. For instance, when we were up at Rucka Rucka, we, we would stay in the bunkhouse at night, you know, and you'd wake up in the morning, go over to the main house where Bobby and Frankie lived, and Crystal was in that house too. She lived there, and Eileen Law was a gal that lived in a teepee up on the hillside. So we're hanging out together every day. It was so much fun because we did country things out there at Rucka Rucka, but Stupid stuff happened all the time. So we had this old um, flatbed truck that herded traded the Durham brothers. I'm going to tell you more about them later as we progress here. The Durham brothers traded him for a 22 uh, old flatbed truck. I was driving it one day and parked it. And Bobby just bought one of the first cars. We all ran around in these old jalopies that you could buy for a hundred bucks they were old cars from the 40s and 50s mostly but they were beautiful cars and wherever we went we had an eye on cars all the time we could tell you whatever year a car was that was the way we grew up knowing the cars were so distinctively different each year and so you learned a lot about taking care of yourself to get down the road this way you know and keep moving Everything we did was 
what we call balls to the walls, man, all full on, especially when we were out traveling with the band. So at home, we were always rehearsing every day and we always had a rehearsal hall where we hung out, which was so cool. And the crew was forming itself in such a way. Now we had a couple other guys come in and out. Everybody wanted to work for the band, but it was difficult. If you didn't have the, the way the fortitude to show up every day on time, because like I say, everybody was so loaded all the time, they couldn't handle it. But if you were able to do both, then you were our kind of guy. And so we start each day by playing or working, depending upon what it was. And so much stuff was all bonding together and we were becoming one. And at this point, the Grateful Dead bought the Alembic PA after Altamont when we really started building something. There was a guy at, at Alembic where we worked, and his name was Sal Cardinal, and we called him Dirt Face. That was his nickname for us. He worked at a place called Zach's Electron Electronics on Market Street, and we bought all of the accessories that we needed for electronics building from him. And so Owsley did his magic on him and he entered the fold and he began to teach us how to build and woodwork and build a studio flooring. We started with the floor and we started building cabinets, a 14 ply finish birch plywood that Owsley insisted on. And, and we started learning woodworking and how to build cabinets and how to port them. We start expanding that PA and because the original Buchla bottoms went to a place called Pepperland where we did shows, famous show with Janis Joplin and, and the turtles were hanging around with us at that time. They were there, but we had a pretty amazing night. We'll get into all this stuff as we go along. The Big Steve Backstage Pass is going to take you back into this world that we lived in. And what I talk about, the Backstage Passes, which um, I'm going to put some of those up and show you guys what they were like. I thought I had some right here with me, um, and I do. But... <laughs> Oh, here they are. Nope. Yeah. These stick on passes here or backstage passes. So that's what you get right now. You guys are getting stick on passes. And as we progress with this thing, there are going to be gifts and ways for you to get them. Things like this will be available to you. If you answer certain questions or you follow this podcast or YouTube channel, as we call it, that's what it is. You're going to learn and you're going to learn along as I did. And the amazing things that began to happen. Um, you know, all this stuff was coming together, but opened the door, remember this, from doing a simple deed of kindness, opened my whole life to these people. And it took a long time to get to know everyone, even though we were all living together on the road. And and you, that's what was amazing. I, I'd room with Jerry, I'd room with Bobby, I'd room with Phil. You learn their characteristics. They were open. There was no hierarchy thing like that in the Grateful Dead. We were just a unit. That was a lot because of who Jerry was and what he he liked about us and what he liked the crew. And he loved all hang out with us because he would always want to come to a show in the afternoon. He wanted to be there when we almost got there and loaded the gear, stage on with our gear. He wanted to be there to watch everything. He was fascinated by it. There's so much stuff. It's incredible. It's going to be a great relationship we're starting here today at this first show. And 
I'm going to have to take a break right now to talk to my producer. Let's see. How long have we been doing this? How can I help you, Steve? How long Uh, is it? How long have we been on? We're we're at 55 minutes. You can sign off and tell people goodbye if you'd like. Yeah, that's exactly what I felt. I thought we'd gone over. This is just the beginning, my friends. Just the beginning of a great journey. And I'm taking you with me right along with it into that world. It's the world that I got to see. And I think I'm one of the luckiest people ever because of what happened next which we will continue in our next show and watch for us always the big steve backstage hour big steve backstage pass because you're coming into a world that is going to be very different than other ones you have entered because I got you and you got me and we're going to take it just like we do on that beautiful, serious radio show. It's been so successful because of you guys come along with me now on this visual trip. We're going to start and we're going to have a lot of fun. We're going to put some videos up here. We're going to love to show the lifestyle. Tune in again. And I'll see you then. Love you.